Hello, loopers, and thank you for joining us in our first iteration of Learning to Loop, the computer science education podcast. Today, we'll be talking about turning students into teachers, an effective way to scale computing education. As the demand for computing education grows, institutes of higher education continue to see growing class sizes and lower resources. One effective solution universities turn to to manage thousands of students in computing courses is student teaching. Today, we'll be sitting down with coordinators of Stanford's CS198 section leading program, and we'll be discussing how to maintain and grow a student teaching system. When I was in school at Stanford, I was very fortunate to teach with this program as a section leader, teaching students, grading assignments, and holding help sessions. I know the power of this model firsthand, and I'd love for you loopers out there to hear how it works. In our very first iteration, we welcome recent CS198 coordinators, Colin Kincaid, Kylie Ju, and Sonia Johnson Yu. They are incredible master students, leading a program with around 100 section leaders, teaching over 1,000 students. This episode was recorded on the campus of Stanford University on June 11, 2019. Let's jump right into my conversation with them. Hey. Hi. Thanks Hi. for having us. Hi. All right, let's get started. I'd love for you guys to fill me in on what the section leading program is and what your role as the CS198 coordinators is in managing the program. Sure. So we generally break the um, role, our role that we fulfill as a coordinators into three different parts. There's the hiring of the section leaders, but then there's also the training of the section leaders. And then finally, there's um, the sort of social aspect slash management and keeping the program running. Um, and when I say section leaders, I'm referring to the undergraduate TAs that we have um, here at Stanford. Also, just to give a little bit of context for scale, because this is different from a lot of other schools, we typically have about 100, more or less, active section leaders in any given quarter, where we are in the quarter system rather than the semester system. Um, and it's almost entirely undergraduate TAs, we sometimes hire graduate students who are okay with being paid as if they were undergraduates, where sometimes graduate students are paid more. We can talk in more depth about each of the individual components of our role that Sonia has mentioned. To quickly address the other sort of part of your question in terms of how this differs from other schools, we know that some schools, including notably University of Arizona and University of Washington, have very similar programs to ours because the same person started them in all three schools. We, we have some, this case of, uh, I guess, divergent evolution in a way where we have all sort of gone our own paths and there are slight differences to our program, but the idea of this undergraduate TA program where, in all cases, students who are usually graduate students are running the program is pretty consistent. Um, what does differ a little bit is the scope of our responsibilities and the scope of the responsibilities of the section leaders and the coordinators, um, as well as the size of classes, the amount that section leaders are able to do, um, number of section leaders available, and to some extent, things like popularity of the program and how easy it is to staff the program, that sort of thing differs. Um, we also have this convergent evolution where some other programs in other schools like uh, Harvard are sort of moving toward models more similar to ours because people are identifying similar challenges in different schools and drawing from best practices that exist in different institutions. So what are some of the biggest challenges that you've had to deal with in terms of growing the program? We know that at Stanford, the computer science major is growing very rapidly, and we want to know sort of how the program has kept up with these increasing class sizes while maintaining strong quality of teaching. I think, so a couple of the issues or uh, challenges we faced during my time as a section leader, not just during my time as a coordinator. I think, um, so during my four years as undergrad, I saw us move from the model of requiring section leaders to only section lead for one quarter to requiring them to section lead for at least two quarters um, before um, deciding whether or not they wanted to continue in the program. And that actually really helped with retention. I think partly that could also be due to the fact that um, Section leaders feel a lot more confident after they've had a second quarter of section leading, um, and then it encourages them to continue as they move on in their Stanford career. 
but that has really helped us. The class sizes have grown, uh, and also encouraging people to teach for CS1 or CS106A, we call it here, and then CS2, their second quarter. That's usually the most common uh, sequence we see with section leaders in their first two quarters. The other challenge I think we've faced is also, as Stanford has been deciding what language to teach its introductory courses in, how we train our section leaders to be prepared in multiple different languages. Over the past couple of years, I think it's one or two years now, we've been experimenting with sort of teaching the introductory CS1 class in not only Java, which is what it's been taught in for the last, does anyone know how many years, 14 or something I was like going to say 10 or 15, something like that. Yeah. Um, it's not only Java, but also JavaScript and Python, and we're actually moving towards Python um, going into next year, but that was sort of up in the air for the last year or so, and so we had section leaders who needed to help during office hours with both with Java, JavaScript, Python, and C++, which is what our CS2 class is in, so thinking about how do we prepare them for that. And I think just to hit on something that Kylie mentioned, the biggest overall challenge that we face from my perspective is just having enough section leaders, um, which <laughs> I think is kind of obvious, but what's not obvious is how to deal with that, because there are so many different ways we could approach this problem. We could approach it from the perspective of hiring more section leaders, making sure section leaders stay on longer, so retention, um, and even within hiring, like, do we just try to get more applications? Are we trying to uh, get applicants more prepared? Those are all, I mean, we've tried all of these things, and we are trying all these things all the time. But the challenge really is this cycle where when we don't have enough section leaders, the section sizes become very large. And then in that case, they have a lot of work, they get overwhelmed, they don't want to section lead again, and then we have fewer section leaders, and then the section sizes are larger again, and just goes on like this. And so the thing that would sort of solve everything if we were able to get it right would be to just have enough section leaders, but um, we are always working on that. Wow, what I found really fascinating about that is, as a former section leader, I had no idea that there was ever a one-quarter requirement. I always thought it was a two-quarter requirement. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so and, that's pretty crazy. Well, that's just, it, it's funny because we talk about this a lot. Like, we sometimes have to introduce things that are unpopular among section leaders, such as this idea of making our weekly staff meeting required, where for section leaders who were part of the program at a time when it was not required, they sort of are uh, not happy with this change. But we recognize as a sort of long-term viewers of this situation that like very quickly, section leaders won't know that it ever wasn't that way. And so we know that we are able to make unpopular changes that are good for the program because the people who knew that it was ever different don't necessarily stick around and make a noise about it for too long, if I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, the flip side to that is change. we also make changes that are sometimes more favorable, but pair programming, which is also something we did to sort of help with section leader retention and reduce workload with section leaders, that also didn't exist when I started section yeah. leading. Yeah. Yeah, and then it, section leaders just take it for granted, like, oh, we're working so hard relative to these people in the past. Like, no, in the past there wasn't pair programming, so you should be grateful whenever you have any people pairing up <laughs> rather than just like complaining about only having one pair. So, yeah, slash grading programs just by like maybe code reading uh, was a thing in the past. Yeah. Like on paper code reading. Yeah, on paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, but now we have tools for section leaders to actually grade them, so. <laughs> so these types of evolutions in the program, like grading on a computer, and <laughs> pair programming, and requiring people to show up to section lead for two quarters. How do you guys sort of come up with these visions and drive the program in the right way? That's a great question. Usually we start with, the question is like, what is the problem or what is the thing that we're facing? And then um, generally we will get into a room together and we will like, we will brainstorm about it. And then often we will send out a survey to the section leaders. Um, this quarter we piloted a town hall um, where that was supposed to be actually more of a like we want to loop section leaders in uh, with our decision making process but generally the people that we talk about when we're looking to make changes in the program are section leaders head tas and lecturers we have quarterly meetings with lecturers that um, allow us to propose things 
with them and then hear their feedback on it. And then with their feedback, we often will modify whatever changes we're planning on making and then go forward and implement them. The other way we get feedback about the program is we also have these mid-quarter evaluation forms. Um, there's one that goes out to the specific CS1 uh, or CS2 classes, so we get feedback from all of the students in those courses about what's going well, both with the section leading program, but also just the class more largely. Um, that's for feedback for the head TAs and lectures as well. Um, and we also send out one for specifically CS198 for the section leading program so that we get feedback anonymized from all of the section leaders to understand the sense of community they're feeling, what parts of the job they like, what parts of the job they don't like, how their specific class that they're TAing that quarter is going. Um, and I think last quarter we also actually did an end of quarter evaluation form, which worked out pretty well. Yeah, and we're doing that this quarter as well, and, and we'll be doing it in the future. So some of the changes are driven by, we want this, and we've thought for a while that it would be good to have this, so let's try it, such as the end quarter evaluations. And some of them are driven by pure need, like, we really have to change something in order for this program to keep working. An example of that is this sort of recently fairly uh, completely overhauled curriculum for training these section leaders, where partially we needed to adapt to the fact that a few times we had just way more new section leaders in one quarter than we had in the past. Partially the fact that uh, just last quarter we had new section leaders in our CS2 class, as well as in a CS1 class that is taught differently than it had been in the past in a different language. And so we just have to make changes in order to accommodate that. And then there are also things that are sort of somewhere in the middle between we need this and we would like to do this, such as in order to address uh, having enough section leaders long term, we recently implemented this program where we have training workshops for preparation workshops for our applicants to the program so that not only can they be better prepared for the interviews, but to it also serves the purpose of sort of leveling the playing field a little bit. And basically in the past, you would have a big advantage if you knew people in the program already who could help you prep for interviews. And we want everyone, even people who are not currently represented in you know, our program or in CS more broadly, to have good preparation opportunities to become section leaders. Yeah, I really want to hit on that point of hiring a large group of diverse section leaders that can really speak to the diverse crowd of students taking these introductory courses. How do you incorporate this kind of diversity into your criteria for hiring section leaders? What is your criteria for hiring and why do you do it that way? We have heard from other CS educators that people, the people who are the best TAs are often people who in their classes would explain to their peers, would help their peers understand what was going on. And that's certainly something that we're looking for. We're looking for the kind of people who are explaining concepts to their peers in their own classes. Um, and we're also just generally looking for people who are invested in education rather than the top computer scientists in their field. Um, and we're looking for people who are coming from lots of different backgrounds, all backgrounds. I think there's this myth that you have to be a computer science major or an electrical engineer in order to be a section leader. But in fact, we have lots and lots and lots of section leaders who are music majors and biology majors and classics majors. And we find that they are often really, really good, especially these people who come from the humanities who are focused on sort of logical thinking um, or like writing. We find that they are able to articulate their thoughts and sort of teach to students at the intro level as well as are better than their peers who actually study computer science regularly. Our hiring process is broken into three different parts. There's the application, the uh, teaching interview, and the deb debugging interview. So um, in application, they'll both do a series of teaching questions, which might be like, explain pointers to your little cousin who likes octopuses and soccer. Um, and then there will also be a number of debugging, uh, two different debugging questions. And then a section that will ask applicants to watch a video of a person teaching section and then critique what they did well and what they could have done to improve. So we want to, um, in the application phase, we're looking to see 
are these applicants starting to think about what good aspects of teaching are? And then also how effectively are they able to teach a problem to someone who may not have a CS background? So the second part of the application is the teaching interview. And we will have applicants come in and teach a 15 minute segment of a recursive backtracking problem. And what we're really looking for there is are they able to help students um, and students are intended to be the driving force behind section. That is really our philosophy in CS198. So is this section leader or prospective section leader able to help students develop the recursive intuition necessary to solve this problem kind of on their own? Because the section leader is supposed to facilitate problem solving but not give the answer. And then finally, the last part of the process is a debugging interview. And we're looking to see um, whether or not our candidates are able to talk through their thought process, because what we really want them to be doing in our office hours is teaching good debugging strategies. So we're looking to see that they have good debugging strategies, and we're also looking to see that they're able to communicate that with students. And yeah, I think that's <laughs> and there is a smaller part in the debugging interview where we are trying to assess their technical knowledge, but usually almost anyone who has taken the first two courses and done fairly well in them is prepared to be a section leader in terms of knowing the content well enough. We are, as somebody mentioned, really just trying to see, are they able, do they have a good debugging strategy and process for themselves, and are they able to communicate that with the students in a way that is welcoming and productive? That being said, I think um, the note Colin said about like, oh, people who necessarily have done like decently well, that tends to be the group of people section leading attracts, but by no means do we actually like paint grades as a like cutoff into whether or not we will allow someone to section lead. We care much more about their performance in the application process rather than like how they did in their CS classes prior to this, because we strongly believe that the content knowledge is something that they can often learn and the debugging process is something that develops over time as you continue during your time at Stanford. So it's more about are you able to be a good teacher and create a welcoming environment and help other people learn? For sure. I think we really take a growth mindset approach to the application process. Um, and in fact, a lot most, in fact, uh, section leaders apply multiple times before they actually get the job. And we have a really feedback-oriented process uh, where we will give people feedback. Uh, in fact, I've got you know over 20 feedback emails to write right now um, on their debugging and also on their teaching. And we ask them, like, we would really love to see you again next quarter and see how you're incorporating the feedback. And we'll actually look to previous feedback that we've given them and see, like, how well people are growing when we're making our decisions about hiring. So this process of giving feedback, offering so earnestly that students should sort of ask us or applicants should ask us for feedback is one of the measures we've taken to promote diversity among our hired section leaders because there are some studies that have shown that people coming from underrepresented groups tend to uh, sort of I'm going to say this in very untechnical terms, take it more personally um, if they don't succeed in something and believe that uh, it reflects more on them as opposed to on this specific situation. So by giving them feedback and encouraging them to, to apply again, we are able to, um, I mean, I guess have them apply again, where, whereas in the past they might not have done that because they had one bad interview. And there are a number of things we have tried to promote diversity in our applicant pool in recent years, so it's hard to isolate what has been most effective, but we have seen that in the past, I would say, two-ish years, where we've been trying a bunch of different things, um, just sort of observationally, I think that we have increased the um, diversity of our newly hired section leading classes. So how do coordinators communicate with lecturers when they have changing course content to keep the course uniform for new students. In terms of how the coordinators work with the lectures of any given quarter, um, part of our job each week is meeting, or we call it syncing, with a specific lecture and head TA for each class once a week to understand 
how is the class going? What can we be doing to support them? How are the section leaders for their class doing? And we usually divide that among the three of us, uh, such that one coordinator is meeting with one uh, head TA and lecturer per week, or sometimes two, depending on how many classes are offered that quarter. So that's sort of where we gain the understanding of what is the lecture's vision for the class? Are we supporting them in the ways that they need to be supported? And also just sort of, it's a space for us to communicate what our goals are as well um, for the section leading program in the given quarter. One of the really cool things about the Stanford CS department is that it gives a pretty free reign for lecturers to make changes to the classes as they see fit. Um, and I actually have to say that head TAs have a really big role in making sure that um, each class runs smoothly from quarter to quarter because generally head TAs will stay on for you know, a year or so. Um, so often the head TA plays a big role in um, making sure that there's some consistency in terms of section problems and the content that we're going through. Um, so yeah, we get to work with the head TAs and the lecturers to make sure that um, we can you know, bring the lecturer's vision to fruition while um, still having it work with our infrastructure that we have in place. Yeah, I think the, so the point that Sonia mentioned about lecturers at Stanford just having pretty big leeway to change things is really important because I know that at a lot of schools, instructors aren't allowed to change very much due to logistical reasons of like the intro class being related to a GPA cutoff or related to some um, sort of filter that allows students into the CS major, which we just don't have. The, the classes have to be sort of consistent from quarter to quarter or semester to semester other places, and we have no, no such requirement. So as a consequence, lecturers are able to make sometimes very big changes within one quarter, and those at times create challenges for us for the logistics side of it. And basically, we do our best to work with the lecturers to just as Sony said, like allow their visions to come to fruition. Um, also communicating to them what those challenges are from our perspective so that there is communication and discussion of like what the best way to implement their changes could be to not overly burden one part of the whole process and uh, structure of the teaching the course. I think we also are in a sort of unique position to build off of what Colin said, where we sort of are the voice of the section leaders and making sure that they have a reasonable workload, that they're able to do their jobs in a way that um, is well structured. But at the same time, we really want to support the lecturers. So we sort of act as this in-between of we want to support the lecturer's vision, but we also are supporting the section leaders. And to go back to your question of like, what are the consequences of having a program that's so student driven and as a result sort of consistent from quarter to quarter is that I think there are upsides and downsides. The upsides is that we have a lot of freedom and like teaching section is completely up to the students, but at the same time there's a lot of institutional memory and so when you do want to make a big change it's actually very hard. Um, and that's something we as coordinators have to navigate to make sure there's good communication between the section leaders, their expectations, how they're feeling about changes, and also what the lecturers want. Let's expand a bit more on what makes the Stanford introductory course sequence different from other schools. What are the responsibilities that section leaders have at Stanford, and how does that differ from similar programs around the nation? I'd love if you could highlight what is good about the current Stanford version of this program and what can be improved. In terms of what is good, so the three of us um, went to SIGSI, which is a conference on computer science education, largely about higher ed uh, earlier this year. And we were really, I guess we shouldn't have been surprised, but we were really surprised to hear just how limited um, programs or non-existent programs at other schools were. And I think coming out of that, I felt really fortunate for the resources we have here at Stanford. But things like undergraduates are not allowed to grade or look at students' grades in other courses. Um, the bigger problem often is that undergraduates can't be paid. Um, so I think we are fortunate to be at an institution where we have the resources to pay our undergraduate TAs. They're allowed to grade and we have 
auto graders and a tools uh, staff who actually help make the grading and workload a lot easier. So to, yeah, to build on that, I'd also say that um, IGs, which are interactive grading sessions, mm -hmm. are one of the most unique things. And I don't think I ran across anyone, um, any other program that had these. So these mm -hmm. are 15-minute face-to-face feedback sessions in which a section leader sits down with their section e or the, part, uh, the pair that wrote the program and then talks through um, the functionality of the code and um, t gives them feedback on their style. And it's really intended to be um, a time of personalized teaching and um, really like help facilitate growth for the students so that the students don't just you know look and see what grade did I get and then like click out of it without getting the feedback. Um, and I know that a number of section leaders keep track of their section needs development from assignment to assignment. So it's really cool because it's this in-person feedback, but also the section leader is tracking how um, you're growing and also giving you feedback like, oh yeah, you did a great job on this last assignment. Now the next thing I want you to work on is decomposition or whatever that thing is. Um, so I think IGs are one of the things that make our program super unique. And the reason that we're able to do IGs is because we have undergraduate TAs and we're able to have these large staffs and have a high teacher to student ratio. Yeah, I think that's a lot of it. And I don't want to reduce this to um, an answer where it's just like Stanford has more resources. Because to be fair, the resources we have do enable a lot of the things that we're able to do, um, as Kylie mentioned, being able to pay our undergraduates and pay them at a competitive rate relative to other jobs, for example, um, so that students are able to do this without it being you know, completely voluntary, which would also attract a less diverse crowd. It's a whole thing there. Um, and at other schools, as Kylie mentioned as well, like undergraduate TAs or TAs in general, like maybe can't grade or maybe can't hold office hours. And we just don't have those sort of restrictions. But also we are, uh, so it's, it's the resources, but it's also the fact that we have this fairly robust uh, training program for them. And the fact that our section leaders are just very motivated and are willing to put in truly an unreasonable number of hours because one of the things that, one of the restrictions that we don't have is a limit on how many hours per week a student can work, an undergraduate can work. Uh, we normally have a limit, but in practice, like, we have these undergraduates working sometimes 15, 20, even upwards of 20 hours a week, which is a lot and really more than I would argue is reasonable to expect of undergraduate students. But we have these amazing people who are really interested in CS education and who are willing to put in the time to make sure that the outcomes for their students are as good as possible. I think one other thing that makes a CS198 program um, special is that there's definitely a cool factor that's part of the culture. Um, I think a lot of people, I think it's over 90% of undergraduates go through 106A, which is our CS1 course. So almost every undergrad who goes to Stanford has had a section leader. And for a lot of um, students, they see their section leader and, and say, wow, they are so cool. I would like to be like them. Um, and the, the thing that's beneficial is that we've got this culture of the CS198 is a really cool thing. And it's kind of part of the Stanford experience, so to speak. So we're able to um, have a pretty big application pool just because people see their section leaders in action. And then they also hear from friends, oh, section leading is cool. So they, uh, they apply. We get about 180 applications per quarter, uh, which is like really awesome, um, which I think is, makes us unique from a number of the other programs as well. Building on this cool factor and sort of the fact that the 190 program is very respected and is very fun on campus, I wanted to ask you all, what is one of your most fun moments working on CS198? 
I definitely have fond memories of Bach, which is our annual road trip um, that us coordinators organize for section leaders. It's just a time for section leaders to bond and to um, get their heads together and be creative, making you know music videos and also <laughs> solving puzzles. Uh, this court, this year, we actually had them solve puzzles um, in order to get to the next location. And we were going through places that didn't have cell phone uh, reception, but it was totally okay. They all rocked the puzzles, and um, we had like we had a really good time. Going to Sixie was also one of my favorite memories. The yeah. conference that we all went to. Um, I would never have gone or had the opportunity to go had I not been coordinator for this program and I learned so much about computer science education and the things people are working on across the nation and also somewhat internationally yeah. um, and that was just awesome. Yeah. Sixty was so inspiring to be in this group of people who all feel passionate about CS education and focusing on the students. How can we make education better? And that was just really phenomenal. We have our traditions like Bach and we have I mean, it's incredible the people you meet in this program. That's certainly one of the draws. Like, I similarly have a lot of my close friends from this program. Um, I think we also haven't been giving enough credit to the job itself, which is amazing. I, and I'm sure every section leader, has uh, incredible memories of teaching a student and then suddenly they understand it and they are empowered by this understanding of computer science, which is just... Um, important tool for their lives. Uh, and this is kind of self-ingratiating, but the moments when students thank you, like, it just feels different from other things that one does at Stanford, because you see so clearly how you're able to make a difference in someone's life. And uh, it's just, it's different from other things that are mostly self-serving in the activities we do. So for those who haven't tried it, why should young and motivated students consider teaching computer science? There's a phrase that we say when we're trying to get people to section lead, and it's learn to teach, teach to learn. And in that phrase is encapsulated this idea that um, teaching facilitates mastery of material. Um, and I really have to say, after um, teaching our CS, version of CS2, um, this one quarter, where which really emphasized recursive backtracking, um, I felt prepared for any interview question in the world that dealt with recursive backtracking. <laughs> yeah, I think we've mentioned how fun we think the program is, and that's a huge draw, and uh, you certainly learn your own computer science knowledge better. Uh, you learn how to teach, which it's actually, I, I take some issue with this, but the fact that most TAs on campus, whether it's for computer science or not, are not really trained in how to teach. And it feels silly that this program run by people who don't necessarily have a background in education are the ones teaching education to some extent, but there aren't a lot of opportunities short of getting an education minor as an undergraduate to learn sort of how to do teaching and I think there are so many valuable takeaways from our program in terms of communication skills uh, and empathy skills and it's hard to articulate how many things I've gotten from this experience but uh, it is really unique among all teaching opportunities that one has as a student here because you are taught how to work with students, what are the underlying pedagogical principles, and you get just a lot of practice doing it, which you don't really get in most other situations. I think it, section leading is like the ultimate leadership training mm -hmm. because you learn how to help a group of people um, synthesize their ideas and then you also like nudge them in the right direction, helping them solve a problem. And then you also get to, you know, do these one-on-ones with students and, you know, get to know them as people and figure out how you can support and encourage them as people as well as students of CS. Um, yeah, I think it's such a fantastic opportunity to um, grow your skill set and just be a better human. 
and the relationships with students was definitely my favorite part in terms of getting to know them on an individual basis, to the interactive grading sec sessions, and really showing them how computer science can be applicable to their lives regardless of what they want to do in the future was one of my favorite parts of the job. And I think the last thing I'll add, um, in addition to the community aspects that Sonia and Colin have already talked about, is that you actually get to understand the computer science department at Stanford a lot better and get to know the lecturers for these giant CS courses that otherwise you wouldn't normally ever have the chance to interact with unless I guess you're super proactive and go to their office hours, which many students um, aren't naturally that way, including myself. <laughs> um, so I think that's a huge benefit as well as just um, having exposure to the lectures themselves and the other people inside the Stanford CS community. For sure. We have lecturer dinners every quarter and it's a chance for the section leaders, like four, five section leaders, to get together with a lecturer and just chat. Um, whether or not it's about like you know general life advice or stories from back in the day, <laughs> or if it's talking about you know, the ethics surrounding big tech these days. Um, I've always really enjoyed these the lecture dinners and it's yeah also one of the highlights of the job now. The other thing that you just reminded me of, Sonia, is the fact that 198 has this history. One thing we always mention is that Marissa Mayer was a section leader at Stanford. In fact, she was, uh, I think, I have recently learned, I thought she had been a head TA, but she had actually like, lectured a course or two here um, through section leading. And there we have all these examples of classic like tech executives, but there are also these you know, doctors and writers and politicians, even like incredible people who have been part of this program. And whenever you mention that you're you were part of the 198 program, that you were a section leader at Stanford, perhaps at an internship at a company, you will a inevitably find section leading alumni, and b they will be so happy to talk to you about it because it's such a big part of the experience of everyone who does section lead. Um, it's this you know, not to be cliche, but like a bond that transcends like when you were at Stanford that I felt very lucky to be a part of. And to contextualize this, the section leading program has been around for over 30 years at this point. Well, it's really cool to hear about the history of this program, and I'm wondering a little bit more about the history of you all and how you got involved in teaching computer science. So I had never seen code before I came to Stanford. And in fact, I had never seen a line of code until autumn quarter of my sophomore year. Um, so I took 106A that fall, didn't do super well in it, um, but I liked it. I thought it was fun. I thought that it was very well taught. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take 106B. Take 106B. Um, it's taught by Chris Peach, who is fantastic and inspiring and... One of our future guests. Woo! <laughs> and what... Um, I got from taking that class from Chris was that, wow, there is so much that I can do with CS. Um, so then I continued on. I took the next class, our equivalent of CS3. And then I had some friends who were like, you know what? You should section lead. It's a really cool opportunity. And I was like, I don't feel necessarily qualified. I did too, too well in CS106A. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing in our equivalent of CS3, um, and they're like, oh no, no, like, I think you would enjoy it, I think, and I was like, well, yeah, I, I really do like teaching, and I have been tutoring music and algebra, um, so I think it was the, I think it was part of, like, the cool factor, and my friends being like, hey, I think this is something that you would really love, and then also this draw of teaching and wanting to get more experience teaching um, is what drew me in, so then I applied and got in and then just kind of dove into the program. I was very fortunate that when I went to high school, although my high school didn't offer any computer science classes uh, during the time that I was there, I was very fortunate that I went to a high school where I was able to do first robotics and that was sort of my introduction to programming because my high school didn't offer any computer science classes 
except for the first time they did, it was my senior year, and at that point it was too late. But my high school robotics team was actually mentored by a previous coordinator of this program. Um, and he and another mentor, who also was a section leader during her time at Stanford, uh, they sort of, when I, they heard I was going to Stanford, were like, you should check out the section leading program. So that mentor and another mentor of the program who also used to be a section leader and was one of my inspirations for even considering engineering as a future study, really encouraged me once they heard I was going to Stanford to check out the section leading program. They said it was a huge part of their undergraduate and parts of their graduate careers. Um, and so that's how I heard about it, um, sort of referencing that idea that CS198 has been around for a really long time and the legacy or the memory of it definitely sticks with people and passes down um, throughout the years. So that's, how, that's what inspired me to find out about it. Yeah, when people ask this question, which people ask the coordinators often, I think, what got you into section leading, what got you into computer science education, um, I can talk about the fact that I tutored in high school and the fact that I like CS and stuff, but the actual real reason why I started, why I thought about joining the section learning program was that I had uh, an instructor in my very first quarter here for this sort of like supplementary uh, CS class that was like sort of just for fun. Um, he had been a section leader before he lectured this course and then he went on to be a coordinator, but I just liked him so much. I thought he was so cool and he was so encouraging to me specifically and told me that I should be a section leader, told me that I'd be good for, for the program, and that, I don't know, that it was important to do with one's time at Stanford. And I saw him saying all this, and that I saw his, like, incredible presence as a lecturer in this course, and I just thought, like, if everyone in this program, or even some of the people in this program are like you, it seems like a really wonderful group of people, and I, like, I want to be part of this for the wholesome reason of, like, I want to be hang out with these people, but also, like, selfishly, like, I would love to be seen as one of these people. And so I don't love this honest answer because it makes it seem sort of not for the love of the teaching and for love of the students why I started, but I certainly got those things as we went on. You want to be like the people that you admire. Yeah, yeah. and that's why I've come to accept that, like, this is actually not only, like, a, a logical answer, but, like, kind of a good one and a one that I hope other, uh, that, that sort of, I feel good about the fact that a lot of people have answers similar to this because, yeah, one person can really make you, I mean, one person can change your life, but they really can. And this person changed my life. And it's always, like, we hear so many stories of section leaders whose lives were changed by their section leader. And that's ridiculous and so cool. And we are so privileged to be able to help facilitate that. Let's shift gears to talk about an important decision for introductory computing courses, programming language. We all took our initial courses in Java, but Stanford is now transitioning to teach in Python after testing with Java and JavaScript. What makes a good introductory programming language, and why has Stanford settled on Python? That's a good question. I think I would lead by saying that in the grand scheme of things, choice of introductory programming language doesn't matter that much because ultimately, your CS1 course is about teaching programming methodology and like what is good code? You're going over control flow, you're going over decomposition, and these things are completely language agnostic. That said, um, I think some languages are definitely easier for beginners to start with, but I'm thinking about CS106A. In the past, that was taught in Pascal and then that switched to C and then we transitioned to Java and now we're transitioning to Python. And I think in general, you want to be teaching it in a language that A, people are using and B, that isn't, you know, too impenetrable. Um, but I think that all of these languages that I listed off are in the realm of makes sense. And then the, I guess the one other consideration to keep in mind is like, what are the students who are in this class going to go on to do? And if it's a bunch of, you know, physics or biology or, you know, political science students who are looking to learn more about, you know, scripting and whatnot, like if you're trying to help students who are not necessarily going to go on and work in computer 
computer science, then I think Python is a really great option at this point because it, I don't know, gets them into, kind of gets them a foray into the data science world because like, this is something that Python's really good for. But in terms of like creating um, computer science fundamentals, I think that it doesn't really matter what language you pick. Yeah, I definitely agree with Sonia on that front because at this point, I, when I started section leading, it was in Java and it has been for a while, and I really enjoyed teaching in Java. I think it was also a good transition to C++ in terms of language similarity. And at first when I heard we were switching languages, I was not sure how I felt about it. But at this point, I've also now, I, I tutor outside of Stanford and I used the 106 uh, curriculum in JavaScript. And I saw a lot of benefits with that in terms of students being immediately able to open their code in the browser. Sharing was super easy. It's really great if they have any interest in sort of making web pages, which especially for a younger audience, that's often um, a huge draw. Um, but then now Sonia and I are collecting the Python version this summer, and I've been convinced again in a completely different direction that I really think Python is a very accessible language. It's super applicable to other fields. And so I think that the short answer is you can definitely do it in any language and there are benefits and downsides to each. And I think that Stanford is moving in the right direction in the sense of following trends that other schools and industry and other disciplines um, are moving in, which is Python is a really applicable and accessible language. And I actually feel like in this case, that is the right thing to be considering, the actual use in other contexts. It's funny that you asked this because just the other day I was reading a paper about using rare programming languages as the introductory course's language. Um, so they were talking about, gosh, I'm not even going to remember <laughs> what any of them were because they were rare languages. And <laughs> Scala was the most common of them. Um, but the basic idea is they were evaluating these languages on various axes such as accessibility, sort of like uh, how simple the hello world or first program in this language looks, um, how easy it is to transition from that language to the next language they see or to industry coding, that sort of thing. Um, also just sort of various, various pedagogical considerations. And I think what it, my takeaway was, yeah, you can use so many different languages and they're just, they all have different uh, trade-offs. I think that, um, Sonia and I, when we were talking about this before, mentioned the idea of what do you want to teach object-oriented programming versus functional programming versus any other paradigm. And I think it is nice when you have a language that allows you to do multiple. Um, Python is an example of this, where I think, well, I won't say what I think of when I think of Python, because I, th I was you know, raised in the school of Stanford where everything is object-oriented until very, very, very recently. Um, but you can certainly do functional programming in Python if you wanted to. And I think the, the recent offerings of 1.6a in Python have been moving toward a slightly more functional outlook, um, or at least incorporating some aspects of it. But um, I think that we, we will see in the sort of quarters, years to come, how easy it is for students to transition from Python to C++, because one of the big concerns was, is it going to be harder for them to transition that way than from Java to C++? Um, or is it not going to make a difference? And what we will see sort of without any sort of, I doubt, is that like Python is going to be more useful for most people taking this class than Java was, because so many people, like, you know, the majority of the university takes this CS1 class. And I think most of them are hoping to use programming for something in their daily life that Python can automate much more easily than something that you have to like use, uh, what's it called, an interactive development environment for. Because Python, you can just write a text file and then run it in your terminal, which every computer has. Like, it's great. Um, so it sounds like I'm pushing for Python, but really, like, I think you can do lots of different languages and you just have to be thoughtful about the pedagogy that you're teaching the class with. Thank you all. You've clearly been very insightful on the topic of what it means to create a good introductory computer science ecosystem. For all the budding student teachers out there, for all the new section leaders out there, 
what advice would you have for people just starting to teach computer science? I think to section leaders, I would say really focus on a student, focus on the student's growth, acknowledge the growth that you see and see where the student can go um, and like, make sure that you help them to see where they can go with their knowledge and with where they're at. Um, and I'd say like focus on inspiration because I think that that is kind of part of the bread and butter of good teaching. Like if a student is inspired, there's no limit. Like the sky is the limit. So figure out yeah, what will make a student's gears turn and then you can kind of set the limits. Yeah, I think in terms of actual like teaching strategies, once you've gotten them inspired, once again, the answer is focus on the students. I think that the one of the biggest challenges that a lot of the teachers, especially students, maybe not even especially students, one of the biggest challenges they face is being too expert already in the subject they're teaching and it being hard for them to teach with the, the point of view of what the students need. And I think the most useful thing for me when I was teaching was always focusing on, if I were a student right now, what would I be finding hard about the material that is being taught? And then everything else follows from there. The things that you focus on in class follow from there, the ways that you present it in class follow from there, the ways that you talk to students when you're helping them figure out their own issues follows from what is hard for them at this moment and why is it hard and what can I do to bring them to where I am based on having done it for so, so long. I genuinely care for each individual student in your section, both on the academic level, but also on a personal level. And I think if you can achieve that, then students know. Thank you to Colin, Kylie, and Sonia for sharing with us. And thanks to you for being a looper. Since this is the first episode of our pilot season, we welcome and encourage any feedback. Thank you for tuning in, keep learning, and we hope you stay in the loop.